the science did not want to go anywhere near any crazy lawyers who might at some time decide to spring some sort of trick on him. The Department of Justice had decided that they were not going to win the appeal. Focus. In this episode, we are joined by returning guest, Australian TV reporter, journalist and author Andrew J. Fowler, who specialises in human rights and national security. In this episode, we'll be examining the release of Julian Assange. Andrew, welcome back to The Focus. Thanks very much, John. Andrew, can you give our audience a brief overview of the Assange case and what led to Julian's release? Well, a brief overview is a little difficult to do, but... Uh... <laughs> It took Kevin Rudd, he said, about a year to uh, work his way through the machinations of, of the uh, legal system in the United States. And um, uh, that was certainly a, a lot of work for Kevin Rudd. But he wasn't alone, of course. He was supported by the Assange family and, of course, all the supporters around the world. But what was surprising was the speed with which it suddenly came together, which sent us all scrambling for our atlases or for our Google Maps of finding, well, where the hell is Saipan? <laughs> and why is he why is he there i mean that's yeah. the thing why is he in saipan and the thought was well maybe it was because um outside the continental united states maybe it was a, a different legal constitution of some kind but no it was just the fact that the science did not want to go anywhere near any crazy lawyers who might at some time decide to spring some sort of trick on him into um further uh, legal jeopardy in the United States. So Saipan was chosen because it was an outpost on its way home to Australia. Um, the interesting thing about that particular decision was, right, for me, was why so soon and why was it made? And what we do know is the Washington Post published some documents the other day which said that the Department of Justice had decided that they were not going to win the appeal and the, they were going to lose the appeal. In other words, Assange was going to be free to walk if the if the court uh, heard the case that Assange had brought based on uh, the uh, freedom of uh, speech provisions of the American Constitution, and it was really interesting because um, Assange hadn't pushed that line very hard in their in their court case before. They'd been arguing about whether it's a political prosecution or not, and eventually we get to this position where the Department of Justice are going, "Hang on a second, they've asked us, that's the British High Court, to guarantee that Assange would have." First Amendment rights of freedom of speech. And they they couldn't do that. They couldn't give Assange those rights. So consequently, they wrote a memo saying, which the post got, got its hands on, saying, we think we will lose this case. So I think that would be one of the major reasons why they would say, we don't want to suffer egg on our face in the UK after 14 years of pursuing this guy. So we'll do a deal. And I suppose from Assange's perspective, it was like this. He thought, look, he didn't want to sign the deal. He didn't want to make any admission because that admission has far reaching consequences for every journalist around the world. But at the same time, the fear is, of course, the return of a Trump presidency. And then he would be completely scuppered because it was the Trump presidency that uh, instituted the, the um, uh, prosecution of him after Obama failed to do that because of the so-called New York Times problem. So I think that uh, in the end, the scientist just said, OK, well, I'll, I'll, I'll do this. But even in court, in Saipan, he stood there and said he thought the Espionage Act set, a, set against the uh, constitutional rights of freedom of speech. He made that point very clearly, and it was actually a very good point. But he scuffled out the door and got on a plane and came back to Australia, much to the amazement of all concerned. I was doing a little bit of reading uh, with regard to what Julian had to say and do in front of the court in Saipan. Can you please explain to our audience the things that he had to do to, in order for him to basically walk on the plane and fly back to Australia? Wasn't there some sort of uh, um, regret that he had to express and were there words that he had to say for the judge to be satisfied that he could actually rubber stamp Julian's freedom, basically. Yeah, I think he had to accept the fact that he'd published material that was uh, in breach of the of the Espionage Act, and and that was it. It was a 
pretty sort of low crime. It wasn't about theft or all the other 78 charges or whatever it was that, uh, that were accusing him of everything, all but sort of breaking into the into the State Department and stealing mm -hmm. files, um, were gone. That was a very low-level um, crime that he uh, admitted to committing. And what was interesting was the way in which this document was written was such that if, uh, if either side decided that they weren't happy with the outcome, either side could pull, could, could pull out and the side would still be free to walk. And yet, he, and yet he wouldn't be, and yet he could also then be charged with other things, I think. So it was like, it was a very complex, and people are still wading through the fine print, trying to work out exactly what that plea deal was. It seemed that uh, he had, in fact, made, those, made that statement, at the same time said he thought that the Espionage Act and uh, um, freedom of speech were, uh, were not compatible, but at the same time, he could then walk out the door. He would be given bail. I think the argument was that if they decided that the, neither side was happy, that he'd be given bail and then and then could leave. But that's not quite the full story, and it's not quite the full understanding of exactly what that document meant. Did Julian have any friends in the U.S. State Department and within the Biden administration more generally? Look, I don't think um, it would be true to say that. Uh, I mean, Julian had friends, if you like, in a, in a, from a political perspective, like um, Robert F. Kennedy was a supporter yeah. of his, and he had friends in the legal fraternity. And in some of the, some of the um, uh, some of the um, House representatives were Marjorie Taylor Greene on the extreme libertarian right was a supporter, um, which I kind of wonder how much good it did um, him in Australia. <laughs> but that was another thing. It was a, it was a, a voice in America. And it was that, I think, that voice from the right, from the libertarian right, that would have pushed Joe Biden to make that sort of famous statement to say um, they were considering taking action. Now, just by the way, John, when, when Biden said that, because they were considering it, about the request from um, Anthony Albanese for enough was enough and the sign should come home, it struck me that what we've always been told is that the Department of Justice operates totally separately from the presidency. So I really couldn't see why the presidency was involved in this case. And what that to me showed was that that was the lie to the idea that this was not a political prosecution. If the president can talk about the resolution of a case, he is clearly involved in it. And therefore, I would say it's, a, it's got a political um, element to it, which uh, you know figures in the argument about Trump saying um, that Biden was politically prosecuting him. And the problem that Biden had, I thought, was then to say, well, he's going to um, intervene on Assange's behalf. And that would then allow the Republicans to say, well, hang on a sec, he's, he's actually interfering in the DOJ. So that was the big fear people had. He couldn't help Assange because of the Trump problem. At the same time, you actually got him saying that uh, they are considering it. So what does the president know about what was going on and why was he involved? I take it that it was a, a political decision, which we knew it always was anyway. Well, I suppose you could say that the stakes were so high from a national security perspective, which then leads us to the whole argument. Was this really about security? Was it about freedom of the press? Uh, what was the stakes that were being played for? Because, I mean, this was a very high-level game of poker that was being played right up until the time that he boarded the flight to get out of the UK. So how do you think this played out in terms of trying to uh, finesse that uh, grey area between national security on the one side and the need for the public to know about what goes on in, in military theatres on the other? Well, I think it uh, caused immense problems for um, journalists who um, handle or see or deal with national security uh, matters which affect the United States of America. I think that's the overarching sort of um, problem that we have with uh, Julian having gone down that path. Not that anybody, I think, reasonably blames him for what he did. He, he suffered enough. But certainly the implications of that decision allow some saving face by the intelligence and uh, uh, Department of Justice establishment in the United States. But it causes immense problems for people that do national security reporting because yes. 
anybody who gets involved in doing that kind of work can face a a charge of um of the under the espionage act and not guaranteed to be um given access to freedom of of um uh, of speech now that hasn't been resolved um in the united states and that's quite a tension how are they going to resolve that because that's bigger than the new york times issue as they call it it's actually going to be whether or not someone can can use freedom of information can sorry can use freedom of speech against a, a charge um in, um under the espionage act to answer your question about that finessing, I mean, I think the idea that somehow journalists are out there just throwing stuff into the onto the net and, uh, you know, journalists being people like Assange, like me, like like uh, the Guardian reporters, like like Peter Gresser, like all the other people that we have that do this kind of work, um, they actually take a lot of time to, to work out what they should do that's in the public interest without destroying the natural interest. And everyone bears that in mind. And every, I mean, Assange has made some mistakes in the past. There's no doubt about it. The Afghan war logs, there were some problems with the Afghan war logs. But you also got to remember that they did try to contact the State Department through Eric Schmidt from the New York Times, I recollect. And there was no reply. So they were frantically trying to, to get those things straightened out. Um, I think that there was, a, I think there were errors there. But and I think Assange has actually said he would have done things, uh, done things differently. But the, the fact of the matter remains that nobody was killed. They couldn't find anyone dead. And they all looked for it, the Pentagon, during the, uh, during, during the um, uh, Chelsea Manning trial, um, said that they looked, could find nobody who'd been killed as a result of those leaks. And the other big problem, talking of dumping stuff on the internet, the allegation that's always been made that Julian Assange dumped a thousand um, cable gate cables on the internet or even more than that, um, and uh, and was guilty, therefore, of putting out unredacted material. How that came to be is that Assange had given um, David Lee, the Guardian an investigation reporter, a very good reporter, given him access to the files, and David Lee wrote a lot of really hard, good stories from those files. And David Lee and Luke Harding, his co-author in a book about WikiLeaks, used the passphrase uh, for access to those documents as a heading, as a chapter heading. And that was picked up by um, a guy called uh, Domscheit Berg, who was number two to Assange at one time, they had a falling out. And after that, um, Domscheit Berg gave the information to Der Freitag, which is a newspaper in Berlin, and they published it. And then people just went on the net and, and published the files. Now, now Assange, I think wrongly, immediately went on the attack and, and, and downloaded all the files and put all the files on the net to mirror what was out there and saying, well, if they're going to be out there, I want people to know that their names are out there and they come to our, our site, they can see where the names are. They can see who's been outed. So that's the full story. Whereas what we tend to get is just that one side story saying that Assange put these files on the net and named all these people. It's a much more nuanced and more... Um, I think interesting and an informative way of looking at the at the problem of how to deal with sort of those mass massive massive files of information. You know, I had a conversation with a, uh, a friend of mine uh, here in Adelaide not that long ago. It was on his podcast, and we were talking about Julian and. He did mention that many years ago here in Australia, we used to have something called the D notice, which would come out from the Department of Defense flagging sensitive material that shouldn't end up on the public domain under any circumstance. Now, of course, we've kind of gotten rid of that, but in its absence, we have no real guidance as to where journalists can look and what journalists can report. And I assume that in the United States, it's a similar kind of gray area where you know, you get a bunch of information, looks pretty interesting, or it looks like a hot potato, it's in the public's interest to know, according to yourself, and then you do the email dump, thinking that you'd be okay, only to find out that you've just hung yourself, not only in the court of public opinion, but probably in the court of the opinion of those people running your national security apparatus. What do you think of the old way of self-censorship when we did have the D-notice? Was this something that benefited journalists reporting on national security so they had clear guidelines as to where to go? Or are we now so sophisticated that it's all about you, the individual reporter, and it's on you, the individual reporter, if you choose to actually 
say whatever you think needs to be said in the public domain, even if it crosses the national security red lines. Uh, that's a very, very interesting, a very, very good question there, John. Um, if I could just talk about the position in the United States and the Guardian. Yep. The Guardian, when it got a whole bunch of, of, of documents from, uh, I recollect it was Edward Snowden, um, published them out of the United States using the First Amendment right, as a protection. Right. And of course, the United States administration went absolutely apoplectic. And the reason they went apoplectic was because nobody really uses the First Amendment defense in the United States because they they are um, patriotic Americans and they don't do that kind of thing. And so when the Guardian is sitting there saying, we're going by the Constitution, the, the feds were going, well, we're going to raid you. And they were, they were threatening to come in and... Uh, and uh, and take over everything. Well, you know, the, the Guardian did did eventually go ahead and publish the material, uh, but there are a lot of pressure not to do that. Um, going to the um, D notice in the UK, which I sort of um, know a bit about, but um, that would be uh, a way of of really working with the national security reporters and telling them, you know, confirming material. And really, I think it's a very difficult job because they have to say, okay, look, this is really damaging to us. It makes us look like idiots, right? And the government mm -hmm. looks terrible. Yeah. But actually, it's not that important. Now, if you can get to that stage, I think you're on really good turf. The problem is that everything comes under national security. I and mean, I think it should, to coin the old phrase, come under the notion of, of, of national embarrassment. A bit like the WikiLeaks cables, I mean, you know, they sort of, uh, they were just, I mean, most of them were secret, which were like sort of pretty low classification, really. And not even that. I mean, it was terribly embarrassing to have this stuff out on the net. The other thing, it means if you're being, if you're being hacked, I mean, look, here's part of the problem as I see it. Here's um, Chelsea Manning, Bradley Manning, as she was then, sitting out in Iraq, and she's watching George Bush, as I remember she said, on telly, saying all these absolutely nonsensical things about what was happening just down the road from her. And she says, look, it really pissed her off. She says, I'm here. This is this is a nonsense. The American people are being lied to. And so I think sometimes, you know, if intelligence agencies, and they do very often indeed, and I think this is the point, tell the truth, the problem is their political masters don't want to hear it. And that's where the that's where the friction occurs. And that's where journalists find themselves really caught in the vice on that. Should there be this friction though? I mean, again, uh Considering that we've had, you know, the the Chelsea Manning, Julian Assange, and uh, Snowden, Edward Snowden. I mean, you know, we've had now a number of these people step forward, step into the breach, if you will. Mm -hmm. You would think that maybe someone, perhaps in journalism or maybe within government, might think that we are all in democracies. Our national security apparatus serves democracies and our freedoms and so on and so forth. So there must be a happy medium by which we can move into the future together as opposed to, you know, look at each other from, you know, the, the position of mutual suspicion and hatred moving forward, because it doesn't really serve anyone, does it? Not at all. No, I mean, it's an ideal world. And I no. do think I do think most of the classifications, what I'm told, uh, actually, Paul Barrett, who was the former um, mm. Secretary of Defence, yeah, I mean, he said, there are about three secrets we really need to keep and they're really important that we keep them mm. and i think that's fine but it's the other stuff it's all the other stuff which which is like methods of and journalists don't normally deal with methods either that's the other thing you don't want to use methods and operational matters no but, yeah but the other stuff is like it's it's stamped it's classified because it actually causes problems which are not really national security problems, but they're but they're they're kind of management problems, handling people problems, handling other countries problems. I, if you're going to run a democracy, and we're doing our best, and I think we I think we I think we're having a bit of a hard time at the moment, particularly in the United States. But you're running a democracy, you got to level with the population and 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 tell them what you're doing. I mean, yeah. at the risk of of plugging my latest book um, called <laughs> New. Um, <laughs> Actually, we just still don't know why the hell AUKUS exists. I mean, Penny Wong tried to get the, the truth out of the minister out of the, the military um, before the election and, and failed to do so, except to say nobody quite knew 
why we needed AUKUS, because no one had determined that we needed it. So the due process was completely non-existent. So those are the things that I think when the public sees that, they go, well, actually, what's the point of, what's the point of, of um, well, what's the point of voting sometimes, but what's the point of having a government if the government just, just treats you like a, some sort of a tradable asset in the advancement of their political ambitions or even their, their business ambitions in later life? Kind of cynicism is a real problem, I think, in, in the community. Getting back to Julian, and oh, by the way, before we uh, continue on, I, I will say we will plug your book a little bit later, so just hang tight for that one. <laughs> but um, with regard to Julian, you know, every time we've seen him on the cameras, he looks gaunt, he looks pretty awful. How is his health going these days? I mean, surely he must have gotten a real kick upwards when he knew that he was going to be released. So is he sort of physically recovering from his stay in Belmarsh? I don't think that's possible in the short term. And I think the fact that he's being shielded by his family um, yeah. is, a, is an indication of, of he's, he can't be in a good space, even though the scientist's remarkable resilience to survive yeah. that long and living in the five for five years in a, in a square meterage of a, of a cell I mean, and one hour a day of coming out. I actually didn't believe that when I first read it, but it was actually true, apparently. One hour of exercise a day, <coughs> excuse me, outside the cell. And here's the other problem. It's all over in a matter of moments. It's 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 12 years of, of anxiety, and then and then in like 24 hours, you're out, you're on a plane, and you're walking into you're walking into Saipan um mm. under the palm trees and uh, you know in 30 degree heat. And then getting on a plane and going to Australia, flying over where you were born, Townsville, and, and coming into to Canberra and stepping out into this massive, you know, this crowd of people and this wide open space, which you hadn't been in for years and years and years. I mean, that's sort of the, the, the way that you the way that you can overcome that, the way that you can readjust re-entering society, I would have thought is extremely difficult. I mean, the, uh, the Neil, Neil Metzer, who's the, um, the UN reporter on torture, uh, said that Assange had been tortured and categorically then went through the list of, of what had happened to him and how he'd been, um, how he'd been, um, as he said, tortured by the British state. And he thought he should get compensation for that. I mean, that's a pretty big call. And we didn't seem to rise up as journalists and say, you know, one of our own is being tortured because of the disinformation campaign that was run against Assange pretty hard by the United States and smearing his name and all the rest of it. I mean, it was some, um, you know, I think as Richard who once said, put me in a room with a man for 24 hours and I'll get him to admit to any crime. I mean, <laughs> they, were just, they were really going for it. Yeah. And, uh, and some of it stuck. I mean, some of it rubbed off and, you know, I mean, you know Julian's a brilliant man and uh, and uh, he, um, you know, he, he clearly would have had trouble out of thought dealing with all those lies that were told about him. Andrew, now Julian's on terra firma here in Australia. Um, do you think that the political left in this country will canonize him in some way, putting him into the pantheon of national figures of the left? Or do you think this is justified? Or do you think that this is something that Julian even wants? I mean, as you say, you know, he's been incarcerated for so long, it's taken a physical and mental toll on him. Mm -hmm. um, surely he would like to have his life lived in relative obscurity from here on end, so he can recover from the process of having being badly treated, yes? Yeah. Vaughan Smith, who runs the Frontline Club, he's an ex-soldier in London and a great supporter of the science. He said that uh, we were talking about this issue, saying people were, he was going through a hard time, the, the, the media were against him, uh, people were disavowing his journalism, even though there was a, a Walkley Award in the cupboard in the Frontline Club for Walkley, for uh, WikiLeaks. And and uh, I said to him, I said to Vaughan Smith, I said, look, I, you know, it's really... um." I'm, I really don't know why he's, you know, he's being punished so much by people he's provided so much for. And he said, one day we will put up a statue to Julian Assange. Now, having said that, I think that that's the last thing that Assange would actually want. I think he believes not in heroes, but that we are all heroes. He actually believes that uh, everyone has an act of heroism in them. And I don't think he even thinks what he did was heroic. I think he just thinks it's what he does. It's his work. And he's prepared to suffer for it. Now, a person who's prepared to suffer for the kind of work he's done for so long, I mean, maybe he should have a statue put up to him, but I don't think that that's what 
Assange personally would want. Uh, Andrew, just uh, just on that point, though, I mean, do you think that if Julian had his time over again, uh, that he would have still leaked the Iraq war documents? Uh, do you mean the ones that, that got out that weren't uh, that weren't properly processed? Yeah, I think he yeah. probably would. No, right. I, don't think, I don't think he would. Hmm. I mean, I don't know. I mean, you have to ask Julian Assange that. I mean, he, yeah. he has to answer for that. But uh, at the time, he was a little, he was he equivocated, saying that, you know, it probably wasn't the best thing to do. But he had problems. Um, and he would explain the problems that he had in getting that access, getting the State Department to respond to him. They wouldn't respond. And so, I, you know, he, he was... He was kind of, I, I think he knew it was really important stuff to get out, but uh, he didn't think that uh, it would cause those problems. He thought they covered most of the bases. I don't know what he would say, but if it were me, I would certainly be saying I would be more careful, extremely careful. Yeah. I'm John Bruni, and you're listening to Sage International's The Focus podcast. And from Sydney, Australia, we're speaking with investigative journalist and author Andrew Fowler. Andrew, you have a new book coming out entitled Newt on the torpedoing of the French submarine deal for the Royal Australian Navy. When is this book out and would you return to us in the near future so that we can discuss your book and its findings? To answer your second part of your question, the answer is I'd be delighted to, John. Ah, thank you. The Second, the first part of it is it's out today. Oh, fantastic. Well, there you go. So go to your, your nearest bookshop or go online and do whatever you need to do online to grab hold of Nuked by Andrew Fowler. And I think if we can suggest we can have another chat within the next fortnight, uh, we can then try to unpack some of the issues that you raise in your book, because the whole submarine thing was of quite some significance to uh, to myself personally and from a professional perspective as well. But we can go into those details when we next speak. Thanks very much, John. I'll be delighted to do that. And that was Australian TV reporter, author and journalist Andrew J. Fowler sharing his insights on the release of Julian Assange. Thank you for joining me, John Bruni, for today's episode with Andrew Fowler. To learn more about Andrew and connect with him on social media, check out the links in our show notes. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a free way to support us. You can also subscribe to the podcast on the Ozcast Network, iTunes and Spotify, where we would appreciate your five-star review. Have comments or questions about the podcast? Drop them in the comments section on YouTube and I'll do my best to respond to as many of them as I can. Stay connected with us on social media. Follow me at x at Bruni Doctor and follow the focus on X at the focus underscore sage. From Adelaide, South Australia, you've been listening to the focus. Mm -hmm.